Sitting on a hard chair, try to sit straight. Sitting on a hard chair, this moment won't wait. Listening to the speakers, they're talking about you. Look at all the people, all the people you knew. You would have made it easier. You'd say, tomorrow I'm smoke. That's Lou's writing from the early 1990s, from Magic and Loss. As always, the words written down with no flowery stuff, no fancy footwork, no decorative touches, no metaphors, no showing off about his erudition, no bullshit, just cutting to the chase. So I owe it to Lou, and to Laurie, and to Lola Bell, and to Will, who was barking earlier, and to his mother Toby, and his sister Meryl, and to you, to cut to the chase too. Why, oh why, people ask, would Andy Warhol, Mr. Interviewer, have been this drawn to Lou, Mr. I hate interviews. And the band, Lou, John, Maureen Tucker, Sterling, and Nico. We know that Andy was always interested in the kids who had their finger on the pulse. And Andy was a ticket to something. But this was more, much more, than mutual exploitation. You could say it was love. Some say it was the beauty of the Velvet Underground. Some say it was the music. I say the mind. Lou was the one whose use of language could match Andy's ability to hit the target in art. Maybe the only one ever. The way Lou used words in his work and in his life, there was never any fat, nothing to distract from the subject. Lou always credited two teachers, Delmore Schwartz and Andy, who he likened to graduate school. But the truth is that Lou's umbilical cord must have been attached to a pen and an editing pencil when he was born, and he probably would have written the way he did, no matter what. His writing is the equivalent to Andy's soup cans, his paintings of Marilyn and Jackie, the car crashes, the race riots, and the electric chair. It was so direct, so visceral. It just nails it. We all need to think there's a reason we meet who we do. So Lou, who had no problem with generosity, always thanked Andy as an influence. That other way of looking at things was the flat out real thing he said. I mean a real alternative that I never forgot. Not only did Lou never forget it, he couldn't, he was born with it but he never betrayed or double-crossed himself, and therefore, he never let his audience down, the one he had all those years and the audiences that aren't born yet. Lou's life was constantly changing. He liked that, and he liked good food from the new world and old. Nikki Russ, whose family owns the fabled smoked salmon mecca, Russ and Daughters on the Lower East Side, told me last night, that when she first met Lou at an event for Tibet House several years ago, he pursued her across the room <laughs> to introduce himself. She couldn't believe the legend gave a damn about her bagels and locks. <laughs> he told her, but you are New York royalty. <laughs> Lou, a New Yorker, was also a goner for soft leather jackets, neat cars, spiffy new watches, but one thing that never changed was his vigilance against selling out. He was chemically incapable of it, allergic to it, and also to those who somehow might want him to, expect him to, push him to. Lou was, is, and always will be concrete proof that there is still a way, despite all signs to the contrary, of being a real musician, a real artist, and a real human being. Not once did he go over to the other side, until now. 
and that's a whole other side he's gone to. A few years ago, he asked me to go with him to the Grammys, where he was to get an award for a video, I think. Within minutes of us sitting down, he said, come on, we're out of here. <laughs> he hated all the fakey poo yakking. The organizers panicked. They asked, is he mad? No, I said, sane, very. 